Heads up, this podcast contains some swearing. Previously on Lost in Williamsburg. I, I have that book I told you about this morning. Diary of Hexabeth Blackman. Well, Thomas, you must grant that she is not the most desirable woman in Williamsburg. I won't argue with that. Her birthmark is unfortunate. Once you get a taste of this elixir, it will be you that is the laughing stop. Now, where was I? Oh yeah, here we go. People are fools. Supercilious lick spittles, too scared to think for themselves. They live their lives guided by pointless proverbs and aphorisms, which inevitably get the basic mechanics of human behavior completely backwards. Take, Take revenge, revenge, for example. In, In my experience, experience revenge, revenge is most satisfying when served hot, mixed with mustard and ale and a savory cheese sauce. Not a very popular opinion, I know, but no one sees the truth like I do. No one but you, Cecilia. Gentlemen, your orders are ready. Who had the Brunswick stew? That was me. Here you go, Mr. Holcomb. Lovely. It looks delicious. And the lamb? Uh, Here, please. Here you are. Thank you. And for Mr. Jefferson, your favorite Welsh rarebit. Wonderful. I'm starving. Can I get you anything else? No, this is fine. Uh, May I ask what happened to Cecilia? I thought she was serving us tonight. Well, she's a little busy in the kitchen right now, so I'm helping out. I see. It certainly is lively tonight. I've never seen it so busy. I know. The whole town seems to have gone a little mad. It's a tad unnerving, actually. So, how do you like your dinner, Mr. Jefferson? Well, I haven't even had a chance to taste it yet. Please, go ahead. We just ran out of one of our secret ingredients, so I had to make some substitutions. Ah. I just want to make sure it's to your liking. All right, then. I'll give it a try. Hmm. Well, how is it, Thomas? Up to snuff? Uh, well... It's a bit different, but pleasantly so. In fact, it's... it's quite... Mm. Yes? Are you all right, Thomas? <laughs> Excuse me, I just had a twin dizziness there, but... Uh, the food is... delicious, my compliments. Thank you, Thomas. It's very satisfying to hear you sing my praises. Sing my praises. Not at all, Mrs. Blackwood. In fact, I'm feeling a little inspired. Perhaps I'll sing your praises loud enough for everyone to hear. Sing my praises. Sing my uh, praises. Thomas, why are you standing up? Oh, this should be good. <clears throat> Everybody gather round as I sing about old King's Crown. Dear Lord. For pies and dumplings, it's the best. For they're made with love by Hexabeth. She'll fill your tum-tum with delight <laughs> until you squeal from sheer delight. Uh... Good heavens, Thomas. Sit your ass to anchor. Everyone's staring. Yes, I should sit down. Pardon me, Mrs. Blackman. <laughs> I, I don't know what came over me. Whatever it was, it was quite uproarious. <laughs> it's all right, Thomas. I rather enjoyed the song. I'm not sure the other customers did. Perhaps not. Well, gentlemen, I should get back into the kitchen. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Mrs. Blackheart. I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Oh, aren't you a pretty girl? Yes, you are. Such a pretty girl. All those spots. So many spots. She's a beauty, all right. Best little filly I ever had. I have no doubt. She's very striking. Does she have a name? Yes, sir. Her name is Tulip, and her sister here is Bluebell. Well, Tulip and Bluebell, I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. I look forward to our journey tonight, short though it may be. Good evening, Professor. Ah, there you are, Richard. How are you doing tonight? Well, and yourself? Looking forward to tonight's festivities? I am indeed, Professor. Very much so. Really? You look a little nervous. Well, dining with the governor is a bit intimidating. Even for me. I'm sure you'll do fine, Richard. You'll look quite presentable. That's a very elaborate outfit you have on. Thank you. I think I look rather flash if I do say so myself. Professor, it was very generous of you to arrange this carriage to take us to the palace. It's such a short distance from the college we certainly could have walked. Well, it's a special night. And when you boys arrive in this fine carriage, it'll make a strong impression on the guests. So, so where is Thomas? Isn't he supposed to be meeting us here? I'm sure he'll be here soon. Ah, here he is now. I'm sorry I'm late, Professor. Please excuse me. 
You finally made it, Thomas. Still sick from last night's dinner? No, I'm completely recovered. Thomas, were you ill? Yes, I was in a rather wretched state last night. Cramps and an unpleasant indigestional situation. Ah, Zooks. Yes, well, around midnight when I was at my worst, I sent my slave Jupiter over to the apothecary. Ah. The doctor wasn't happy to be awoken from his sleep, but he was able to put together a concoction that helped me somewhat. Oh, good lord. The situation with the food at the college has grown completely unacceptable. First thing tomorrow, I will go to the president and demand that he do something. Actually, Professor, we dined at the King's Crown yesterday, not the college. Oh, I see. I've always felt it was a rather suspect establishment. But as I have a strong constitution and a cast iron stomach, I am doing quite fine. No need to rub it in, Richard. Come, let's all climb in the carriage and we'll be on our way. Gladly. It's such a beautiful carriage, Professor. Thank you. <coughs> Bit cramped, though. Ow. Pardon me, Richard. Careful with your violin, Thomas. You almost hit me in the nose. Why are you bringing that anyway? Are you planning to duet with one of the palace cats? Ha uh ha. -huh. Actually, Professor Jobrith has requested thy play tonight. Oh, I see. Come now, Richard. You know that Thomas is quite good on the violin. Driver, let's be off. Giddy up. By the way, Thomas, I've asked Richard to perform this evening as well. Really? Don't look so disappointed, Thomas. You might even enjoy it. I'll be playing my flute. Your silent flute, perhaps. I hear you're quite adept at that. Enough bickering, boys. I suppose I should have mentioned that you'd both be performing, but you're so competitive, I knew it would divert your focus. You're right, Professor. Music is an art. It shouldn't be a competition. Or I would win. We'll see about that, Bottlehead. Birdwit. Lobcock. Dandy Pratt. Boys, boys, enough already. You embarrass me tonight, you'll both be on privy duty till Christmas. Good evening, sirs. May I take your coat? Yes, thank you. Thank you. What a festive atmosphere, Professor. The music coming from the ballroom is lovely. I hope we shall equal it when it is our turn to perform. Perhaps we will better it. Gentlemen, let's retire to the parlor. There are several people I'd like to introduce you to. This way. Ah, uh, Professor Jabriath and Mr. Jefferson. And Mr. Holcomb. How lovely to see you here. Mrs. Blackheart. How nice to see you. And you as well, Cecilia. Thank you, Professor. Hello, Richard. Thomas. Good evening, Cecilia. Mrs. Blackheart, you look quite radiant tonight. I may have to shield my eyes through the entire dinner. <laughs> Your dress is exquisite. Oh, please, Richard. You don't need to try so hard. Uh, pardon me, madame. I didn't- Cecilia, I didn't know you would be here tonight. I wanted it to be a surprise. I'm looking forward to dancing all the steps that I taught you. So am I. But I didn't realize I would be dancing them with you. I hope my legs don't get completely twisted. Oh, I'm sure you'll do fine. You're an exceptional student. Is that so, Thomas? Yet another area in which you excel? Cecilia, you flatter me. It is only your skill as a teacher that will keep me from making a complete fool of myself. Well, if he fails to perform to your expectations, I hope you'll give me a chance. We've had many dances back at the plantation, and we'll I often- We'll see, Richard. We'll see. By the way, I have another surprise in store for you both, later tonight. Really? I love surprises. I can't wait. Neither can I. Come now, boys. We don't want to monopolize these lovely women. Let me show you around. Yes, sir. Well, it was nice talking to you, Mrs. Blackard. You too, Thomas. Cecilia, I will see you later tonight, then. Yes, until then. Your attention, please. May I have your attention? Thank you everyone for joining me on this glorious October evening. Before we begin the task of stuffing our faces with pheasant and pudding, let us all raise our glasses and give thanks to the Almighty God for the good fortune that he has bestowed upon us. For tonight, we celebrate Governor Geoffrey Amherst's capture of the city of Montreal. Here's to victory over the French. Huzzah! 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 It is with a full and happy heart, I say. If things continue to go this well for our magnificent general, it certainly won't be much longer before this cursed war is finally over. Now, let our dinner begin. With pleasure. What a magnificent feast. Thank you, Mr. Benedict. Now, in honor of tonight's victory, I have invited many of the leaders and businessmen of our community to join me in this bountiful meal. For it is only through the contributions of people such as yourself, Mr. Benedict, our esteemed wig maker, 
or you, Mrs. Blackard, owner of the King's Crown Tavern, that we are able to sustain our mighty endeavor. Thank you, Governor. I'm honored to do whatever I can to further the success of our blessed community. Indeed. Here's to us, the citizens of Williamsburg. Bottoms up. Cheers. 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 Thank you, Professor. I'm especially pleased that you could join us here tonight. I'm so appreciative of all the hard work you're doing over at the college. It's very important stuff, the education of our youths. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I have asked the Professor to bring his two best students to the ball tonight. Would you like to introduce them, Professor? Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of presenting Mr. Thomas Jefferson of Charlottesville. Good evening. And Mr. Richard Holcomb of River Grove Plantation. Hello. Two of the best students currently studying at the college. Indeed, they are so equally matched, I could not begin to say which one is smarter. Well, perhaps we can find out by putting these young gentlemen to the test tonight. How would you boys like to engage in a bit of conversation about current events? Oh, nothing too serious, I hope. I believe they are both quite nervous, this being their first official visit to the palace. It's quite all right, Professor. I, for one, would be delighted to participate in a bit of spirited conversation. What topic did you have in mind, Governor Fouquier? Well, Richard, tell me. What are your thoughts on the new principles of education being undertaken at the college? Principles of education? Yes, as many of you know, not too long ago, the Board of Visitors engaged the services of one Professor William Small of Scotland. His task to shake things up amongst the faculty by instituting the practices of the new sciences. And as he is not here to defend himself, I'm curious as to whether our two young students here think he is succeeding with his new approach. I say, Governor. You're putting them in quite the sticky situation. They must be very careful in how they respond if they're not to offend certain people. Well, discretion is something they will need to learn to become successful members of society, no? Very true, sir. Very true. So, gentlemen, what say you? Well, sir, let me give it a try. I must say, it is admirable that Professor Small is attempting to bring new educational techniques, such as his novel scientific experiments and curious lecture style to the students of the college. Mm -hmm. But while his experiments, occasionally loud and often rather smelly, are thrilling, I sometimes, I wonder about their necessity. Mm. Interesting. Why is that? Well, Governor, I place more value on the expansion of knowledge to the application of reason and dialectical deduction, and not as much on the mere well, excitement Scottish of the Scottish empiricists such as David That's Hume and Professor Small may suggest that it is our passions that drive the quest for knowledge. I think that is a mistake. Errors in judgment, and bring about what I consider to be, in some cases, rather when questionable. When I eventually conclusion. take my place as the head of River Grove Plantation, I will put the cherished Anglican teachings of Professor Tobriath to very good the wise, use. rational and leader of society. I shall be a model of taste, propriety, and devotion. Oh my, that was such a lengthy explanation, Richard. Yes, but well said, well said. Thank you, Richard. I'm honored by your comments. Deservedly so. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Mr. Jefferson? What is your opinion? Yes, Thomas, do tell. I hear that you're quite the gifted speaker. I'm sure you won't become tongue-tied. Tongue -tongue 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 well, Richard, I take the opposite view. <sighs> no surprise there. Uh, if I may continue, I believe that... Uh, how should I put it? Tongue -tongue 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 I believe that passion is... Uh, that, w that without... Uh, what is the word I'm thinking of? I, I believe the reason... Yes, go on, Thomas. Uh, I, uh, Thomas? Um, Spit it out, boy. I... Thomas, I've never heard you at a loss for words before. Perhaps I could help you out here. I believe what Thomas means to say is that it is our surging primal passions that drive the quest for knowledge, mm -hmm. and that stifling those passions leads to stagnation in society. I, I, and I uh... believe that Thomas might say that reason, which God has so graciously bestowed upon us, that reason alone is insufficient to explain all the mysteries of his creation, and that is why we must constantly fritter away our time in endless experimentation. Only by tossing aside the vast accumulated knowledge of our forebears and incautiously rushing headlong into the unknown depths of our own ignorance can science be advanced. And in that sense, Professor Small is succeeding quite splendidly. Well, yes, I... I suppose that is what I mean, in a manner of speaking. Well, don't look so surprised, Thomas. I certainly understand your arguments, even if I don't agree with them. Well, Professor, you've certainly brought an interesting pair of students with you tonight. Though they act as rivals, they appear to know each other quite well. Indeed, indeed. And how well-spoken Richard is. I might even agree with his point of view if I didn't know Professor Small as well as I do. And Thomas, I suspect you are merely having an off night. Perhaps it is time to turn to lighter topics. Excellent suggestion. Yes, the ladies here tend to become so... Thomas, what in God's name is wrong with you? You couldn't produce a single coherent argument. Are you still feeling ill? I don't know. 
My head is a little cloudy right now, but I feel fine. That was quite a speech, Thomas. Perhaps some fresh air after dinner will clear the cobwebs from your skull. Could you pass me the butter, please? Wow, this diary is something else. I can't tell if this Hexabeth character is lying or she's just plain crazy. She sounds kind of fun, though. I bet she looks sexy. Sexy colonial tavern keeper with long, dark hair and one of those big, poofy bristles. Oh, for God's sake, Dale, this 200-year-old diary is making horny. That is pathetic. You need to focus on the here and now. As soon as Valerie gets back to her desk, you're going to walk right up there and give it one more shot. This dry spell has got to come to an end. This is Cacophony. This is Cacophony. This is Cacophony. Hello, everybody. You're listening to 90.9 WCWM, and this is Cacophony. A friendly little show with a bit of music, a bit of chatting, and all the latest songs from the Pitchfork Music Charts. I'm your host, Caleb Suter, and this afternoon I'm going to start things off with a song by a cool new local band. Enjoy! Hey Caleb, can I come in? Yeah, sure, Lauren. Just give me a second. Come on in. Am I interrupting? No, it's fine. I've got a couple of songs queued up. I'm good for a few minutes. Great. So, how are preparations going for the Halloween bash? Oh my god, it's been crazy, what with everything that's been going on. But I'm doing my best to keep it all on track. What all do you still have to do? What do I have to do? Everything. I've got friends scouring all the dollar stores for decorations. I've got this art major friend, Luke, who's working with me on some multimedia stuff. Uh-huh. I'm picturing classic movie monster scenes projected onto all the walls. That sounds cool. Yeah, I've got to find someone to post flyers, get the sound system ready to go. I've got to get several disco balls ordered, make sure all the alcohol will be here on time. Oh my god. I think I'm starting to freak out a little bit here. Just take a breath, Caleb. One second. Okay, I think I'm better now. Good. So, uh, Lauren, what brings you to the darkest depths of the WCWM studios this afternoon? Well, Zeph and I were hoping to make an announcement on your show about the band. Oh, please don't tell me you guys are canceling. I was really hoping you'd still be able to perform. Well, actually, we're still thinking about doing the show. That's great! Yeah, but the problem is, we need a guitarist for the night. Oh, do you want me to ask around? Well, actually, I was having lunch with Josh and Zeph earlier, and we thought it might be a good idea just to make an announcement on the air so the whole campus will hear. Oh, it's a great idea. I know it's last minute, but it seems like it might be worth a shot. Yeah, why not? Maybe after the next song? Well, let's wait for Zeph. He should be here any minute. Okay. So, in the meantime, I've got a couple costume ideas to run by you. I was thinking I could go as a life-size bobblehead, or maybe the entire cast of Game of Thrones. They both sound great. I'm leaning towards Game of Thrones, but that would be a lot of work. I was supposed to have dinner with Josh tonight, but if I'm going to make a costume that elaborate, I need to get started on it as soon as possible. Wait a minute. You'd cancel a birthday dinner for Josh to make a costume? It's his birthday. He didn't tell you? He just turned 21 today. No, he didn't tell me. You didn't see all the messages on Twitter? No, actually, I haven't befriended him yet. You're kidding! We haven't really known each other for that long. I'd rather just keep things offline for right now. Well, that's fine, but you can't cancel on him tonight. Not on his birthday. Of course not. I'll take him someplace special. Somewhere in Merton Square. Good. Josh really needs it. He's trying to pretend that he's coping fine with Aaron's disappearance, but I see right through him. You have been listening to the Tidewater audio drama, Lost in Williamsburg. Tonight's episode was entitled, Here for the Party. This evening's cast included Will Hausman as Dale Souter, Colleen Kennedy as Hexabeth Blackard, John Shuey as Richard Holcomb, Jacob Stalnaker as John Page, Mark Hutchins as Thomas Jefferson, Frederick Corney as Professor Jabriath, Jack Martin as the carriage driver, Cassandra Glasby as Cecilia Blackard, Timothy Costello as Governor Fauquier, Simon Joyce as Mr. Benedict, Reed Perkins as Caleb Souter, and Kat Turk as Lauren Tasky. Tune in again next week as the story continues. My house is your house. Thomas, are you sure you're feeling up to this? Watch and learn, Thomas. I'm sure it was just an accident. Lost in Williamsburg is written, directed, scored, and produced by Philip Merritt on evenings and weekends as time permits. Thankfully, downloading Creative Commons sound effects from freesound.org helps speed things along. Thank you for listening. This is your host, Caroline Corney, 
saying, don't let Hexabeth Blackard give you the wrong impression about the residents of Williamsburg. She's a total outlier. We won't spike your food and talk smack about you behind your back. We would never do that. Really, I swear. So be sure to come visit us real soon. I can't wait to meet you. Good night.